very unassuming guy, very nice, young. Just, he's 10 years younger than me, so we sort of bridged this gap. But his whole thing was that he was all into this underground culture stuff. He was like, he had read all everything. And he was like me, when he read something, he had to do it. When I read about Greenwich Village, I had to like run away from home and go live there. You know, When he read Kerouac's book, On the Road, which is another one of these uh, um, subculture kind of uh, classics, he, he left home and he went to travel around the road. So he tried to relive this sort of beat generation. Kind of, uh, kind of lifestyle. And that was very unusual for a, for a person this age, his, his age, because uh, at that point, 10 years beyond me, there was the culture had already taken over a lot of the music and a lot of this stuff that was underground. It had become commercialized. Um, so knowing who he was, um, this is one of the first pictures I took. I wrote, this is probably in the first picture in the Reading Eagle about him, and I sort of broke the story in this, in this area about who this guy was. I was maybe the third person to write something about him, identify who he was to the art world in general, because I was also writing for the, uh, the New Art Examiner, which is a, a magazine out of Chicago, an art review magazine. And uh, this was the first thing that uh, I guess he gave me. That was a book that he had printed up. Um, and this just stunned me. There was some, he had invented this series of characters, this, icons, these pictures. And then he would put them together in sort of like ways, sort of like the uh, hieroglyphs of Egyptian. Like, you know, you have a dog and, a, and a, a king and a bull and you have a bird. And so then you put them in different situations without even writing stories. But all of a sudden, you could sort of figure out this story. There's something going on. You can sort of read it just by looking at the, uh, at the, at the images. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is like he has this whole language going on. And they're all like, What's he saying? What's the message? And you know, and so and and so when we would uh, sometimes we'd be pulling into New York, we'd be driving around. I had the car, so and he, I mean I, I never saw him drive. He always rode his bicycle. So and I remember looking at graffiti all over. He was a real student of all the different graffiti. And very early there was this guy Samo that tagged his name Samo, and he ended up to be a famous artist uh, uh, Jean -Mich -Mich Michel Basquiat and. Uh, he started to talk about all the mystical meanings he saw in this guy's work. And, uh, and uh, so he was very aware that there was something. He felt that he was sort of like a channel for this art, this meaning to come through him. If he didn't try to, to, if he didn't know what he was saying, and he just put these pictures together, he had all these ideas. Maybe it was aliens. Maybe it was who knows. He had no, no clue where this stuff was coming from. But he would just let it sort of flow, these pictures, and draw these pictures. And that was an amazing thing. This is very early. All the way through his life, he sort of repeated this. This, to me, is the power of his work, that he invented this sort of unconscious language. Uh, but he was as mystified as what it meant than anybody else. He just really invented these figures, these characters. This is a piece that he gave me. Um, I was at his studio. All this other work, which looks very much different than this. And, and I, this is the piece that I took out of all that other stuff. Now it's very eerie to see a lot of this work uh, uh, to, be, to look exactly like the work that Victor has in his collection. And that's part of the interest in, in all of this going together. So yeah, Keith was a newspaper boy. We were both born in the Reading Hospital. He carried the new, Reading, Hosp Reading uh, newspaper around. So uh, this is a, before he got a, a, a gallery of his own. This was a show that he did with group artists at, at Hal Brown Gallery in New York. So he started to get known. People, people knew he got arrested. They, the Daily News published his name. So it, it started to happen pretty quickly. People knew who he was. This was a picture I took at a, uh, a peace march in New York. This was a no nukes march. And I had seen 100,000 people in the, the park, in Central Park, like in the 60s, for anti-war rallies. This was the first time that in the 80s that 100,000 people had gathered again in New York City. And at this point, a lot of people, this was a big discovery, because people he was giving away free posters. At this point, he had Tony Schifrazi as his gallery, and they were starting to put money behind him. So they printed up a bunch of posters. He gave away from free. But everybody knew what they were getting. They were getting a free poster from the subway artist. And everybody. I mean, at that, that time, there was 100,000 people, and they knew what they were getting. And so he would sign things and whatever. And he became an instant celebrity very quickly in New York, because that's what, that's what happens. This is the first catalog that, was, that uh, Schifrazi put out for him. Um, he would always misspell my name, and then he'd go back and fix it. And he'd just, it's, Every it was a constant thing, so it just became this thing. When he would write my name, he would do he would do things with it. It was either legs or whatever. Um, so uh, the also this this message is always a message of like 
you read it, you know, angels, nuclear baby, the new baby, the, 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 new, the new age, the, uh, nuclear, the end of the nuclear age, the birth of a new baby, anything. You could start to read symbols into there. And it was always based on these very ancient sort of uh, um, heaven and earth conflicts and battles between good and evil. And, uh, and so his work got very complex. Now, what I found was that he was, we, what we shared was this intensity of interest in these subjects and, and this process in which you sort of lose yourself in this repetition of, of, of making art. So that part of be, be achieving this state of mind or being in this state of mind um, uh, was this process of repetition. It's sort of like meditating. When you do the same thing, when you're in there very close. So there's certain things that happened with his work. It was this all over type repetition. And, and we both had that going on in our work. And there's also a, probably the, the, the thing that I sense the most is this. If you're going to work this way, I don't know if the other way is, is, is any. If you're going to work this way, either with dots or lines or whatever, yet the main thing that as an artist you understand is that you have to have an, a real ability to stay exactly as far away from every other part that you are. From, otherwise, everything's going to bump into each other. So when you're drawing a thing like this, you have to be very clear of the space between what you're drawing. It's not just the positive space. It's the negative space. It's sort of like you're carving. And so when you're making dots, you've got to be sure that you don't push them all together, that they're equally spaced all the way going across. So you create this tension of negative and positive space. And he always had that going on. Most people look at his work and they see the images that he was drawing. But the other thing that's going on is the space behind his drawings. We talk about positive and negative space a lot. And there was, there's, there's something there. There's some, he's carving always things like a duality between light and darkness. Um, in the 1980s, I, I happened to be, I don't know, I had my studio there. We both had studios in New York. One day I went to the Whitney Museum to see the biennial. This is not the painting. He worked in series. This, he had a pink version of this painting where the canvas was pink and, he, and these people were pilot people. Think about me and, and uh, growing up in the 60s where there was this free love thing where it was just, you know, you would have sex with everybody, whatever, for want of a better way to describe it. Um, in the 80s, this happened again. But you know what happened in the 80s? Um, people started killing each other because it was AIDS. That's what happened. And nobody knew what it was. I remember working at the newspaper and um, uh, people in the newsroom in the arts department, I was only a freelancer, so I would go in. I, would, I didn't have a full-time job there. I'd go in and do my stories and then leave. But there was this thing like there's this disease that was killing all people in the arts community. They were dying. Nobody knew what it was. And um, so we sort of started to know. People in the arts community started to be up on this. There was this thing going around that was killing people. So it was very odd. I walked into the Whitney, Whitney Museum to see the biennial. I bump into Keith in the elevator, and it's like, hey, dude, what, what's going on? He said, oh, I got a painting up here. I want to see it. I said, well, I'll go, we'll go look at it. So we went upstairs and looked at the painting. And, and, and it was a thought that I had, and I didn't say the thought. And it's weird when you don't say something. You know, in a conversation, you say, I should have said something. You know how that happened? Well, this is 25 years later, man, and I have not forgotten what I did not say to him, which is so odd. And what I didn't say was like, wow, man, they're killing each other. That's what I thought. Those people are killing each other. And it was this completely opposite take of the free love thing. And when they were doing it, when he was doing it, he was a young guy discovering this. You know, it, was a, it was joyful celebration. It was like, hey, we're free. We can do anything we want. You know? and it's a celebration of life. And when I looked at it from a perspective of 10 years later, it looked to me like a celebration of death. And you have to understand there's two parts of this. There's freedom, and then there's destruction. And there's, you, can, you can see it happen all the time. You can see it. It, with artists, you can see it in this community. You can see it in, uh, in your, uh, your music people, the, your, uh, the idols, the people that you idolize in music and in the arts. Uh, they fly so high, and they also they, they die so, so dead. And uh, you know, so it's these two sides of it. And that was very telling and touching, and it was sort of the humanizing. He didn't know he had AIDS at that time, but a lot of his friends started dying.